And my name is Walter Patland. I work for Unite and I come from South Africa. I've lived in Scotland for six years and um, in South Africa I work for Kasatu and for a number of other big trade unions and I'm particularly interested in community campaigning and in building coalitions between different groups of people so that we can combine our strength and, and use that to tackle some of the problems we face. Hi there, my name is John Slavin. Uh, I work for the STUC. Um, this, this course today was part of a bigger campaign, the Better Way campaign, run by the Scottish Trade Union Congress. And you can get further details on that campaign on the website betterway.org. Thank you very much. The first part of the course, which is what I'm going to describe basically, was about deconstructing the hegemony of the accepted truth that's been built up over the last 30 years, that the free market is the only way to run the economy. This hegemony has been built up and maintained through the idea of TINA, which means there is no alternative, a phrase coined by Margaret Thatcher in the late 80s, uh, which has led on to the deconstructing and the dismantling of the regulations that have held the bikes together, which probably means all of you what Clyde's going to take up on. This is David Bowie played a role, apparently. Um, bad loans spread out, sliced up, diced up, sold out, pushed out, goes out into more and more areas, spreads out, filters in absolutely everything, and eventually it basically just acts like a virus until everything's affected by it. Um, I can fill up to even more than 30 seconds, that's amazing. But and Hugo, yeah. in the next and this crisis in which we can relate to the financial sector is through the bank bailouts uh, of Europe and in our case of Britain has led to a real crisis for normal people. Uh, uh, has led to short so in funding. You notice uh, around here, my real school closures is a good example. We've got students here that know. Uh, can clearly feel, feel the effects when the higher education is getting slashed in social services and all sorts of things. So this has uh, things in banks has uh, created real problems for real people, and it leads into what well, top three hands got to see. Uh, thanks, Hugo. Uh, we've got so many solutions to this, and uh, part of the solutions I can't say it now, but. Uh, I'll hand over to Susan, who is going to discuss about the economic bankers and how it's not fair. Thank you. Over to you, Susan. Okay. So, banks should be a simple, integral part of society's infrastructure. Instead, it's been turned on its head and fine that the financial, financial sector dominates. The wording used by politicians, the media, and the banks themselves are purposely there to confuse, but it, it goes deeper than that. Economics is not a science. Banks should be there for the purpose of lending and allowing you to save money. Lending to allow you to create wealth for yourself, um, but instead it's all about high investment and profit turnover for the banks. The banks only keep 7% back um, of the money they lend out, meaning they're inherently unstable. Um, as we know, the banks have reined in spending recently to small businesses because of the recent financial crisis. This financial crisis um, caused by mortgages, etc. In, in, in America has impacted on people all over the world with the myth being perpetuated that it was created by us um, borrowing frivolously rather than um, the truth which is that it was caused by the greed of the bankers. So now I'd like to hand over to Jamie and talk about Middle Britain. Thank you. Right, Middle Britain it seems is actually a, a myth, it's a bit of like an Eldorado that people have been searching for and not actually quite finding. Uh, because I believe there's one uh, MP in Reading who was on about 150k, is that right? And he claimed that wasn't actually that much, that particular part of the country. And statistics there will show well, those earning over 65 grand and above is actually, is that, or under, shall I say, is 96%, so it's only 4% of people earning that. And the actual um, average is 20,800 a year. So the idea of Middle of Britain with your uh, white picket fences, your golf and all that business doesn't really exist, does it? This is uh, Stephen Pollock. <coughs> and I'm 
going to talk to you about how it actually tries to affect people. We've talked a lot about to the, the private sector, and we've touched a bit about the public sector and how the private sector has gotten so much bigger. But we also have this third sector, which is the, the civil sector, and which which really unifies all of us, whether you're a banker or work for the, the government. We all are living the same plan, and if we were able to work together, then uh, we should be able to get a, a, a bigger slice of the pie so, and be able to. Uh, I'm just going to talk about uh, quality. Um, at the moment, there's 3.9 3 million kids in poverty, and a lot of people use the excuse that it's not the parents are too lazy to work, but I would say half of them, of their parents, or even single parents, are unemployed. Um, also, at the same time, we've got 285,000 millionaires living in society at the same time in the UK today. Uh, of the employment we've got, of the workforce is 23% are on around the minimum wage. Um, if you look at the local area of inequality, this year I think this is one of the tenth areas in the UK that's um, or sorry, top ten in Scotland. It's the pride areas, look at the play areas outside. It's all the way run down, it's not taken care of. If you go uh, the road to like, is it Mogai? Mm -hmm. areas like that. The play areas up there are just a back. If you're not getting the money, things are terrible. Um, the next group is doing civil society, it's Liam. Uh, um, we're really talking about civil society. Um, there's two different areas of society that have power. There's the quite powerful um, private sector, uh, the slightly less powerful public sector, and then there's civil society. That's uh, groups like you know church groups, political parties, trade unions. That um, at the moment these groups are uh, don't have quite a lot of power and influence because they're disjointed. People aren't talking to each other, and um, the uh, campaigns aren't joined together. So um, I'm going to hand over to some uh, second bozo who's going to talk a bit more about specific examples of civil groups. Uh, my name is Sikumoza. Uh, I'm going to talk about the uh, uh, MTC, which is which means Movement for Democratic Change. This part was formed in 1999 September through trade unions. Uh, its aim its aims was to bring back uh, Zimbabwean community to the world community and to bring back uh, uh, through business and education as well. So I have to hand over to Kuku, who's going to talk about religions. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm going to talk about my the, an organization that I'm, I'm involved with. Um, it's called uh, the Zimbabwe Vigil. It's a human rights organization. It was established in um, October last year. What we do is we meet every other Saturday at Agao Street and we raise awareness about the human uh, rights abuses in Zimbabwe. Um, people's votes don't count in Zimbabwe. You, you are persecuted just for supporting the opposition. Uh, your life will be in danger for doing that and you are tortured or even killed uh, when the authorities find out that you are supporting the opposition. Uh, what we do is, we also have petitions which the public sign in support of our cause. What we hope to achieve is, um, by raising this awareness about the human rights abuses in Zimbabwe, we are hoping that the, um, the Zimbabwean uh, regime will bow to international pressure and we can at least have a free and fair election in Zimbabwe. Uh, we hope that, um, we are hoping that by the international pressure being aware of what is happening there, we can at least have a free and fair election at last. Thank you. I'll head over to Adelaide. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to talk about religion. I'll talk about um, a church that I go to, which is the UCKG Help Center. Uh, it started here in Glasgow sometime last year, but it's a church that is known worldwide. In the center, we have uh, training, we do counseling, and we have tea shops, and we also go out in the streets to do some evangelism, talk to people on a one-to-one -one basis, trying to invite them to church. We are not ma mainly based on just Christian uh, things. We also try and um, advise people on the practical way of living, but living in a good way, in a religious way, in a more practical way. I'll hand over to patients who will talk about the practical steps of building a campaign. 
Hi, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about networking, social networking. Um, personally, I think um, a lot of people, they've got different backgrounds and different campaigns that they do. So sometimes when they meet is more, they do, about, they do more about what they've come for. But um, I think if people start to talk about personal interests, um, they'll find out more about each other and they might find out that they're more in, they're interested in the same campaigns and they might help each other campaigning for the same causes. So I'm going to introduce you to Alista who's going to talk more about it. Um, I, I was going to talk a little bit about the internet because that's all my job. <laughs> the, um, yeah, so we're, we're in a quite exciting year. We, we have a lot of options in terms of how we communicate with people. It's very important that we um, as we try to build these social social relationships, we've got tools available to us to, to build more social relationships with more people more quickly, if perhaps on a shallower basis. Um, it's very important that we consider the demographics that we're speaking to. So, uh, an older demographic, it might be a case of a personal phone call or um, or even a physical letter, if you remember those. Um, whereas for a younger crowd, it's Facebook. Particularly teenagers don't don't even use email anymore; they just use Facebook. Uh, it's, it's fantastic for us as organisers and relates directly to what, to what we're talking about because um, especially in the, in, the, in the modern era with the things like text message and, and Facebook and email, you can build a communications campaign that's two-way and so it involves that, that conversation you can have to ask people questions and get responses back and adjust uh, what you're saying to them based on those responses. I'm going to hand over to Ednet to talk about um, listening campaigns and... Oops. Uh, yeah, it's not conversations. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm just trying to talk about networking, uh, forming people's connections or linking people up about their circumstances. About their circumstances it means they can participate. Um, I'm going to talk about how you can link up with people and I think that means to link up on a personal level so you can have these personal relationships with people um, that are really important because if, if you need to be able to um, sort of give and take so if when my organisation needs uh, some help I can use my personal relationship with someone else whether it's casual through Facebook or like more, or you've met the person and you've talked to them, you need to be able to use these relationships to, to build your campaign, to get broader support for it. And it's, I think the key is, again, is personal relationships, to build it up on a one-to-one -one basis, to get, gain trust, and then you can gain more support on a wider level. Social organizing and uh, it's like a for that